the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with the author of Surprised by Oxford, Carolyn Weber. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to The Weekly Show. I'm your host, David G. Maloney. On tonight's show, we've got a really special guest. Her new film, Surprised by Oxford, based on her novel of the same name, releases in the theaters later this month, and it details the incredible true story of one woman's self-discovery, friendship, and love amongst the historic background of University of Oxford. We've got Dr. Carolyn Weber with us after the break, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Our featured guest tonight is an incredibly gifted academic, professor, and writer whose memoir, Surprised by Oxford, took the world by storm in 2013. That book has now been made into a beautiful new feature film, which will be hitting theaters later this month. I was blessed with an advanced viewing of the movie and can tell you it does not only have an extraordinary cast, but was also shot on location in Oxford, England, amongst the majesty and allure of the University of Oxford. Uh, here to chat about the novel, the film, and her incredible life story is none other than Dr. Carolyn Weber. Dr. Weber, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. That's a lovely introduction. <laughs> So um, your your book, Surprised by Oxford, came out, uh, I guess, about a decade ago, and but it's mm -hmm. been now given a feature film adaptation with some incredible talent involved. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure much of what I'm going to ask you is detailed in your book, which I encourage everybody to check out. But I'd first kind of like to get to know a little more backstory. Where did you grow up and what was life like there? Mm. Well, I grew up in uh, London, Ontario, Canada, just a mid-sized town in North America. And like many other families, David, I would say uh, I sort of describe it as broken enough not to deserve God's attention, but loving enough to get by. You know, I had um, didn't really grow up with a faith. Uh, my parents divorced when I was a teenager. I worked a lot of jobs. My father was um, charged with fraud and he was in and out of our lives, um, a tumultuous relationship there. And um, and uh I ended up, um, I loved my studies. I ended up re uh, receiving um, a scholarship to study at Oxford University, England, a major scholarship, and it paid everything, which was the most money I'd ever seen. So I went there and studied literature, which was lovely, but I had no idea that uh, I went really independently and um, very sort of self-reliantly and ended up, um, that's where I ended, ended up examining my faith. And, and I was going to ask you if faith or spirituality was part of your upbringing you know, uh, or and in possibly what way the movie kind of hinted with lines here and there, but I I didn't really get any kind of deeper view into it. So you're saying you really didn't have much growing up? No, no, not really. I mean, I was uh, I had immigrant grandparents I was very close to. I, I sort of experienced you know mass in Latin and <laughs> um, Hungarian. I but when they were gone, I, I my mom moved away from her Catholic faith, uh, especially with a lot of the difficulties in their marriage, understandably. And my father was in and out of my life. I wasn't going to trust an eternal father if I couldn't trust an earthly one. So I um, I would have defined myself as probably agnostic because I couldn't yeah. disprove God, but not um, not really too impressed by. And I think like many in North America. Uh, my idea of, of Christians or of evangelicals were big haired TV evangelists that took your money, right? I didn't really have any concept of much of the Bible or of the gospel, certainly, or of a personal relationship with Christ or anything along those lines. It was just um, a stereotype, really, for me. So there weren't really any parts of faith emerging at all before Oxford. Not really. I mean, I think there were echoes from my childhood, my grandparents, of course, uh, and there were, I did know some Bible stories or scripture from studying literature, but those things were really objective. Now, your your title, Surprised by Oxford, uh, takes, you know, blatant influence from C.S. Lewis's Surprised by Joy. Was the title just such an easy decision for you or were there other contenders? Oh, it was just the one that came on my heart from the beginning, because not because I felt like my work was on any level or on par with Lewis's at all, but because twofold, I, I really appreciated his conversion story. And it was very similar in ways that I didn't anticipate when I was going through my own. I didn't know that. Um, of, he calls himself the most reluctant convert in England, you know, kicking and screaming and all the intellectual questions he had, but ultimately that leap into the mysterious. And um, there are things that we can't explain and fully know. But I also, it, it's actually a line from a Wordsworth poem. And I was a romantic po poet student um, studying romanticism and, uh, and Wordsworth's poem really conveys how joy reminds. And I think that's what Lewis was drawing on that, 
when we experience joy, it gives us a foretaste of really what we were created to be. At, at what point did you feel comfortable passing your story off to a filmmaker? I mean, did you have any concerns or apprehensions about that at all? Oh my goodness, of course. <laughs> it's terrifying. Right? You get a pride out of my cold, dead hands. But I had had other offers to have it made into a film, and I was very protective and careful. It was close to topic, close to my heart, um, <clears throat> my faith, my family, uh, friends. But when I got to talking with Ryan Whitaker, who did the screenplay adaptation, eventually he's very talented and lovely person. I really felt safe with him. I really felt like he had a lot of integrity artistically, as well as with the faith. He's a very gentle hearted person as well, incredibly intelligent and very gentle hearted. And we really wanted it to be invitational and um, and not heavy handed. Um, there's a place for all stripes and things, but um, perhaps not to be an altar call movie and uh, to give people the chance to just think about the big questions. And I felt like he was really alert and uh, very careful about that from the beginning. I think he did a very good job with it because it kind of sneaks up on you. And it and and in my mind, it kind of sneaks up on you. Uh, and and you obviously you free to correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it almost seems to sneak up on you in the way that the faith seemingly in the movie is portrayed as sneaking up on you. Um, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yes. I think it is that the goal you guys were going for? Because if it is, it, it seemingly it, it seemingly hit that goal. Well, I appreciate that you you sense that. We were hoping for that because in a way we wanted to convey God's relentless pursuit of us, of each of us, right? Augustine says that he loves us, each of us as if we're the only one. All our stories are important and, and all of us identify with very universal themes, regardless of where we come from. We all want to be seen and known and loved. And I was I was surprised. I had set my hat to live my life with me as the master um, and, uh, as we all, you know, you ain't the boss of me. And, um, I was surprised at, at God by God, by his pursuit, the fact that he's always there. He hasn't gone anywhere. We have, and we wanted to convey that in the movie. Um, it, it seems like, uh, an obvious question considering how your story has unfolded, but what originally made you pick romanticism literature for your postgraduate studies at Oxford? Oh, uh, um, it, I think it was because the romantics, they were shaped by infinite longing. Uh, they really wanted um, Wordsworth and Goethe, the German romantics, the British romantics. They were pursuing something that was reminding them of something bigger, something more important, but they could never quite catch it. Uh, and yet there are gleams of it um, that sometimes you can experience the sublime, but you can't quite hold it in your hand the whole time. And in a way, I felt that really primed me that there was a longing in each of us you know, David, but that makes us human. I think that we we long for that. But um, Lewis calls it sensucht. It's that German notion of you know longing, and and um, and that is a very important theme throughout the Romantic writers in particular. And so I feel like that was already at work in me and my own heart as a human being. And I think God speaks to us in each of our own love languages. And for me, that was literature. What did you feel exactly when attending chapel services at Christ Church Cathedral in those early days? Did you did you feel anything? Did you, was it tugging at you the early then, or were you still in your "you're not the boss of me" phase? Um, that's a great question. I, I, I mean, I think we all approach churches. There's something that happens in that space, right? It's just architecturally moving and everything as well um, that has a hold on us. Philip Larkin has this beautiful poem called "Church Going," and how, in a way, we always want to seek churches. And I remember when I first went. It was just part of the rhythm of the day and church bells saturate the, the sound of the place. You know, it's just part of the music and the, and the pulse. And, and it does sort of trigger, it makes you remember things. It makes you, makes you think about your day and the passing of time differently. And it was the same thing with going to Evensong. I think it's just the architecture is so beautiful that your heart is sort of lifted by that. But um, there's something to be said about really starting to pay attention to liturgy um, to what's being spoken, to what's being sung, to how the music is moving you. Um, and that's not just to say it's sheerly aesthetic. Something There is a power to beauty uh, that speaks to us. And um, and so I think I was moved at first. I wouldn't even say, say so much cynically. It's just sort of, it's, an, it's, it's very inconveniently a beautiful, <laughs> disconcerting, a beauty that, that discomforts, uh, moves you out of yourself. I think the film does a marvelous job of capturing that beauty and, and the romanticism itself of Oxford. I, I've never been, 
but I now feel like I kind of have a slightly better sense of the place. I mean, there's mm. a lot of old places in the world, but what do you think makes Oxford so magical or, or special? Mm. I I really think it, you'd feel in the stones thousands of years of people who have thought deep thoughts there, right? Mm -hmm. And people are pursuing learning and thinking and conversation and meeting people where they're at. Um, it, there is a magic and a beauty to it. I mean, it's just the architecture is just stunning and the way the light falls and the way that it is like Narnia, you know, you're walking on a, a basic busy street with bookstores and everything. And then you go through an arch in a college and all of a sudden it's a whole other world. Um, there's a, a tremendous beauty to it. Uh, and that's conducive to contemplation and thinking and conversation and having a pint. Are, are the classes really that small? Yes, they are. It's called the tutorial system. Mm -hmm. Um, was there a point where you did end up go staying at the provost's home? Yes. Yes. Okay. The figure, the, the figure, in, um, he, he, there's sort of a few figures that had to be collapsed just because we couldn't have so many characters in the film. <clears throat> but, um, but yes, I absolutely, actually, that's one of the things that really spoke to me about Christians was how they walked their talk. They weren't perfect people by any means, but they were living their lives differently. And one of those things that they did was hospitality or just meeting people where they're at, asking people questions, seeing somebody's burnt out and offering them a meal or a night away or whatever. And that really, was an incredible thing to experience. Um, it's different than friendship, it's fellowship and it runs deeper. I'd like to talk about the ingenious casting of Mark Williams in his role. Uh, <laughs> to me, he's such a sublime choice, especially considering his work on uh, G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown for which he you know, plays that fantastic role. Whose Ooh. idea was it to cast him? And, and do you know the answer to that question and how did the, all that come about? Oh, gosh. Well, most of the casting, you know, was done by Evolve Studios, Ken Carpenter, Ryan Whitaker. We were big fans. All of us are big fans of so many of the British actors. All of them, all of yeah. them are fantastic. So I know that they were thrilled to get them on board. Um, but uh, the casting was not in my hands. So I was just thrilled that it worked out like it did. Absolutely delighted. They're all it, wonderful. Is his character based on a real life professor in your life? All the professors are quirky people. I am one. <laughs> <laughs> They're quirky people, but you can't make this stuff up. I mean, they are, um, they love what they do. And, um, and I think they were able to convey that my Oxford professors were geniuses and, and people of great thought. And many of them have great heart as well, open their homes to us, have these small tutorials where you're responsible for your ideal ideas, uh, which is a very unusual in our culture, but also they care for you very deeply because they know that you're one of their students um, so often there's quite a close relationship, but they're also um, very passionate about what they're teaching and what they embody in that way. And and uh, and many of them are are really interesting characters. I presume the concept of that teaching style is, is more so instead of just to teach the subject matter, but also to teach people how to think and obviously analyze the subject matter. Yes, absolutely. Take responsibility for your ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious, did you get to talk to any of the cast before filming? Um, I, I did. Uh, we were brought out to England, um, my husband and I, for part of the filming, which was a really beautiful experience. And so I, I did get to, I had the pleasure of meeting Phyllis Logan and Mark Williams and Michael Culkin, several of them in person. They were just a delight. And, uh, and I have a small cameo in the film that was filmed in the same room in which I heard, a C I went to a C.S. Lewis Society meeting before I was a believer myself. And uh, I was able to share the same lines that I heard that sat with me and unsettled me so deeply. Yeah, you got to have the little part there in your own. Uh, that was Ryan's movie. idea. It was a great, great sort of inside joke in a great yeah. circle of. Well, it's it's funny because in the movie in the good in in the garden, what was it? Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, um, mm -hmm. that was based on a true story as well. And mm -hmm. the fellow who plays the judge in that movie was actually the one of the lawyers that was involved in the underlying case who was one of you know who was who was involved uh -huh. in the mix too. So it's interesting where you sometimes get. Uh, the real person in the movie, but in a different role, which is kind of yes, fun yes. and nifty. Um, so um, uh, were you able to contribute anything with any of the cast that uh, made a difference in how they approached their characters or otherwise, or was it left entirely up to script and direction? Hmm, that's a great question. Mainly up to script and direction, but I was really touched. I mean, I did get to meet and uh, get to know Rose Reed. Uh, who plays me, which is a really weird sentence to say, um, but she's a far more um, glorious doppelganger and uh, <laughs> a great, better version of myself. 
and she's a bibliophile and has a, a lovely faith and it's just a beautiful person inside and out. So I really felt it was lovely to get to know her. Um, <clears throat> and she pulled on some of that friendship a little bit too, but a lot of it she had to develop on her own. So many of them I didn't meet until they were into character, but it was fun to have met them with my husband and uh, to have had that relationship. Well, that that actually brings up a question. I mentioned earlier that while watching the movie, I kind of felt like Faith sneaks up on you in the movie and had to win you over despite some resistance. And and I guess the same could be said for Kent too. Is is that kind of is is that really how that unfolded? Um, pretty similarly, I beat him up pretty badly. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. It, so, yes, he's a brave man. Uh, um, d- d- does he still have the moniker <laughs> TDH? Well, now he's TBH, tall, bald, and handsome. Oh, and... gee, well, there you go. I'll, I'll adopt that too. <laughs> so he he was probably mortified by by that. He's much more introverted and shy and doesn't really want any of the attention, but he, yeah, he's a TBH now quite That's delightfully. Funny. So. That's funny. So there are quite a few voices in the academic space now taking the mantle from people like C.S. Lewis. Um, I guess people like John Lennox, uh, Alistair McGrath. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I was just curious if any of those voices or professors like them were walking the halls of Oxford in your time. Mm, well, Alistair McGrath very graciously endorsed the book. Uh, he was a professor of my husband's um, and uh, and so a great influence, lovely man. I didn't have him personally as a professor. My husband did, um, but I just very much appreciated his example and his work. Uh, so there have been, there's a, 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 there is a really rich intellectual history in Christian thought. And that's actually what moved me too. I, I just assumed that you couldn't be thoughtful and a Christian that, you know, faith and intellect had to be antithetical, right? And any, any idiot would know that. <laughs> And um, it's incredibly condescending, right? When there's actually this immense rich history and there's actually things that we live in in our society that we don't even ascribe or recognize as being Christian and they are. Well, and I was going to actually ask you a question about that later on, which is, you know, you have all these uh, Sheldon Cooper types, you know what I mean? And, you know, where you have this, these highly intellectualized people. And sometimes that doesn't necessarily jive with the concept of faith. Were you... Um, did you find that some of these highly intellectualized professors were people of faith? And when you did find that to be the case, because the movie indicates it, but again, you said there may have been some liberties. It, did you find that some of the professors were people of faith? And and if so, did that catch you by surprise um, based on how intellectual they were and how intellectual you were at the time? Oh, absolutely. And I don't think the film took liberties with that aspect at all, actually. It very much conveyed it that... I was gobsmacked to meet people who who were Christians who were so intelligent. I, I mean, it just rattled my stereotypes, um, and uh, and that had a thoughtful faith and and were pursuing different things, science or literature or history or whatever, and all different stripes. Especially by graduate work, you know, pe- um, people are from all over the world. So to meet people from Germany, Africa, whatever, I was on a Commonwealth scholarship, so. I met people who were wealthy, poor, whatever, different Commonwealth countries who believed in the same Christ. And uh, it was incredible. I hadn't really thought of that mere Christianity. Um, And they were all pursuing different things um, with intelligence and passion. So that uh, that rattled that rattled my cage. (laughs) And I experienced people up close who lived this faith out in, in forms of their care for people, too, David. I think that's what was so striking. I. I was, I had provosts who were incredibly powerful, eminent men, for instance, who opened their homes and, or through an engagement party or, you know, spoke to homeless people. They lived out their faith very, um, w- without attracting any attention to it in that sense. Um, and that really spoke to me. Did the ego and child play a role in your journey other than as a spot for a pint and a good book? And I mean, were you aware or did you care about the significance it carries for so many people? Well, never underestimate the power of a pint and a good book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yep. And some delightful company to discuss it with, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Eagle and Child, I think it, oh, it yeah, where the Inklings gathered. Um, the That kind of, 
you know, we work so hard as undergraduates, uh, as students in North American culture. We really do. And of course they do at Oxford as well and Cambridge and that. But what was really amazing in the British culture was that they had this crazy notion, the British Academy, that you shouldn't have a job while you're a student, at least to start, you should be focusing on your studies. And so you have time as much as you're working hard, but you have time. There's this culture of talking and walking and going out to a pub and everything. And, and I think that ability to digest and, as I said, have responsibility for your ideas and have conversation, you know, that disagreement is not equated with hate. And uh, and like the Aristotelian notion that you can entertain many ideas at once without necessarily accepting any of them. Um, there is a civility uh, there. And that at least opens the door to to talking about the things that really matter. It, it'll be obvious to anyone who sees the film or reads your book, the importance of C.S. Lewis to your journey. And, and Lewis not only wrote the book that inspired your journey, but he himself was an Oxford professor, right? And as was his friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, did mm -hmm. that strike you then as especially special? Um, well, it was very inconvenient because I didn't think, um, didn't expect a professor to be a Christian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> and I, the irony is I had known many Christians in Canada. I just didn't really realize I knew them. Um, they had spoken to me in ways that that played out in my life later. Uh, so sometimes the gospel is overt and sometimes it's embodied, right? There's different ways to plant seeds, but, um, but I, I, as I grew to read more of his work, I admired his stance and his authenticity and the range of topics that, you know, he could write on grief and he could write on prayer and he could write on science fiction or whatever else. And the same thing with Tolkien. I mean, what's so interesting with Tolkien, right, is he's doing all of this through fantasy, but it's still pointing to the real, real. And so um, I did them really moving that way. Selfish question. Did you ever try to find his old office at Oxford while you were there in did. school or stroll by his family house in the kilns? Yes, I did. I, I fangirled. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's why I asked, because I would. Um, I, <laughs> once you were introduced to his work and his associations, did any of the other inklings jump out at you? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> and they are just this wonderful group of writers, um, such a wealth of ideas uh, that, that sometimes go unnoticed, I, I think, in the larger culture. Um, but I ended up really becoming a big fan of the Wade Center, for instance, at Wheaton, which is the, one of the largest collections of the Inklings, and realizing by proxy, you know, Charles Williams and so how many other excellent writers there were really, I, I had touched a little bit on George, George MacDonald, but hadn't read him so, so much more overtly, um, his influence on Lewis. And then also by proxy writers like Dorothy Sayers, you know, who, who maybe dropped in here and there with the Inklings, but, um, you know, uh, sort of were, were part of that circle, really interesting writers who wrote many genres, um, you know, Sayers writes detective novels as well as, um, you know, theology. So uh, all stripes of thinkers. And what's so fun is their conversation they had among each other, um, as well as the different stripes and different ways that they approached um, imaginative representations of the gospel in their works, as well as, as well as academic. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. And a special thanks to Dr. Carolyn Weber for joining us. She's going to be back again next week to finish up our interview. So please tune back in. Stay safe, everyone.